I don't know that there were many who understood the significance of final moments quite like the disciple Peter. He experienced failure, guilt, and pain as Jesus was hauled off to trial. But he also experienced grace and restoration on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus' final words to Peter were some of his most important. Peter's final and personal words to the church have stirred up the followers of Christ for 2,000 years. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 11, we're stirred up to grow this morning. What is Peter's, we believe, Peter's final correspondence with the church, sharing very many personal insights, personal communications, personal experiences, but also some great challenges to the believers that he's writing to. His whole purpose for writing this is to stir them up, in which he mentions twice. We'll get to that in the weeks to come. Next week, um, I hope you will be able to be here and bring a friend. It is a very, uh, it's probably one of my favorite parts of this uh, letter, so I hope that you'll be able to be here as we talk about leaving a legacy. What do we want uh, to be left behind, and how do we go about leaving behind the right things? Last week, we looked at the transformation that was evident in Peter's life, that the Peter that wrote even the introduction referring to himself as a servant, a slave, uh, saying that all those believers he was writing to were standing on equal footing as him. It didn't even, rec- didn't even resemble the Peter that we had seen oftentimes in the Gospels. And we talked about the transformation and the change that took place in Peter's life. This morning, we turn over now because we see Peter, I don't really know how else to describe it. It seems as though Peter is jumping right into this. And maybe his brevity is because of the urgency. Maybe Peter just did this salutation of saying, Hi, I'm Peter. I know who you are. This is what we have. And then jumps right into a very, very important topic. He talks about transformation. He talks about the transformation that is to take place in the life of a believer. And I'll tell you, as I was preparing and pouring back over my notes and my study and and even in my prayer time regarding this passage, there were several things that made me squirm personally. I'm just being honest with you. There were several words that kind of made me, well, I was experiencing some conviction. And there may be this morning some words that make us squirm, you squirm as well. But I pray that at the end of the day when we walk out of here, I hope that every one of us will know the direction we're supposed to go and we will have our feet set on a course in the right direction. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 11, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He, God, has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and with virtue, knowledge, and with knowledge, self-control, and with self-control, steadfastness, and with steadfastness, godliness, and with godliness, brotherly kindness, and with brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. Peter's leading up to something. And in a typical pattern of our New Testament writers, there's a clear path given. I don't think at the end of our time together this morning, you and I are going to walk out of here saying, I'm confused on what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to do it, and what it's supposed to look like. Peter's following a very simple pattern of this is this, and and here's A, and A leads to B, and B leads to C, and D's here because all the other ones are. And I want you to think about four words this morning, and each of these four words, I think, is there's a question that we ought to be able to ask, that that word should be able to answer. And the very first one, not unlike any of the other New Testament letters, if a great truth is about to be introduced, there's some lead up to it. And here's the lead up in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now think about the the scope of that, that sentence for a moment. That His divine power has provided for us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, if we're taking notes this morning, number one, the first word would be this, providence. What has God given? That's what Peter answers in the very first, in the introduction, the the opening path of this great ascension to this wonderful truth. He says, what has God provided? He says, I want you to know. I want you to know what God has provided for you and for me. Remember, Peter said in the introduction, we're all on the same footing here in Christ. You have equal, you have, you have the same faith, you have the same standing that I do, equal standing. Now, what is he saying here? God has also provided everything we need. Everything we need for that which pertains to life and godliness. Wow! That means literally, because of Christ's provision, because of God's provision, I will never be lacking in the resources of life and godliness. That spiritual pursuit of being like Christ. That says that I cannot come back and say, well, I didn't have what I needed, God. I mean, that phrase that God promises, God has already provided everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness, robs me of any opportunity to make a legitimate excuse. And I'm going to be honest, I am a bargain hunting disciple. When it comes to my faith, I'm probably not alone. Maybe we ought to get together and form a little group. Maybe we did. Maybe it's called church. I don't know. Here's what I want. I want the most spiritual good at the least personal cost. That's what I want. I want the most spiritual good at the least personal cost on my part. I want to know that I get all of this, but I don't want to give anything. I am the yellow sticker searcher for spiritual things. I am the clearance rack dude when it comes to spiritual things. I want to give very little. I'm willing to give a little something, but I want to get the most in return. And maybe that's you. Maybe, like me, we're tempted to go open up the Bible and pick out the things we like about Jesus, but not really pick out the things that we don't like. You know, we like the things, we highlight the verses that that talk about what, what we get, but we kind of skip over the verses that... That, that call about us giving or, or the cost to us. You know, we use a highlighter for some and white out for the others, right? That's kind of how we, we were tempted to do And Here, Peter says, no, huh? Peter doesn't let them off the hook. Remember, this is his final correspondence. He says, I know I'm about to die. I mean, if a bee only has one sting, he makes it a good one, right? And here, Peter's like, you know what? Let's jump right into it. You have no excuse, he says, for not possessing the things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, what are those? How did God provide those? Because I don't want to just speak in these terms without us understanding the practicality of what we have. He says it very clearly. He says His divine power has given them to us. His divine power in this sense would be understood as as the person of the Holy Spirit that lives and abides and dwells inside every believer. 
If you are born again, you have the divine power of God in the person of the Holy Spirit living and taking up residence in you. If you are a born again believer, you are literally a walking, talking temple of the Most High God. You have within you everything you need in God's divine power for life and godliness. But it was not just His power. Oh, that would have been enough, wouldn't it? But that's not it. Peter says He's also given us His great and precious promises. You know what Peter's saying? You take the power of God in the person of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of every believer and you mix that with the promises of God and you have everything you need. I have no excuse. As a born-again believer with the Spirit of God living inside of me and the Word of God before me, I am without excuse. We are so tempted as followers of Christ to say, okay, I'm saved. Tip our hat to the Lord, say a big thank you, and go on with our life. When in a sense, if spiritual transformation is to take place, it's going to happen on accident because I'm not really playing a part because that's work. That's hard. Peter slaps that in the face. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the precious, exceedingly great promises of the Word of God. When you and I know the Word of God and live in the power of the Spirit of God, we have everything we need. That's the first step. That's what God has provided. The Word of God and the power of God. But what's the purpose? What is God wanting to achieve? Look at verse 4. By which he has granted us his precious and very great promises. So, here's the reason. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Why did God provide what he did? The purpose is so I could be a partaker of the divine nature. I came into this world with a sinful nature. We all did. And at the moment of salvation, we were given the Holy Spirit to live and abide in us. And now what Peter is saying is that God is developing and transforming us and creating in us this new nature. Yes, down here we still struggle and wrestle with the sin nature versus the spiritual nature. Yes, the carnal man and the spiritual man. We learned last week, he's Peter, but he also has a lurking Simon in his life. You and I all have that. But here we learn, God gave us this power. God has given us his great and precious promises. What's the purpose? So I can be partaker of the divine nature. And this divine nature says that I'm not going to be corrupted by the things of the world that are sinful in their desires. This tells me I'm not going to be corrupt in that I'm rotten. I'm going to be, going to be decaying. No, not this. The divine nature takes on the, the life and the likeness of God in that sense. Life, light. It is not rotten. It is good. It is holy. It is righteous. It is not decay. Not at all. I'm given an opportunity to overcome. I'm given an opportunity in this divine nature to be somebody I wasn't before. I am given an opportunity by the power of God and the promises of God to live a new life, a divine nature, the nature of God that He provides for His people. That is the purpose, that you and I may escape the corruption of the world because of sinful desires. That's how you know you're living in the divine nature. How do I do it? Number three, here's Peter, this typical path. This is what God's given. This is why He's given it. Now, this is how we, number three, participate. Man, he uses some serious words here. Verse 5, for this very reason. What very reason? The divine nature God is inviting us to partake in. This great new nature. This new likeness. 
For this very reason, Peter says, because of the greatness of this, do this. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. Think about those words for a moment. What Peter is doing is a literary tactic of the day, very common among the Greeks. What Peter was doing was saying, you have, you have this, and then on top of this, you add this. And then on top of that one, you add this. There's a relationship between these virtues. Please don't miss this. Peter's not telling us what to do. He's telling us who to be. And he places the responsibility on us. Because of this, for this very reason, be diligent to add to your faith virtue. I know we want to jump right into virtue, this first thing we add, but we can't get past faith. It's understood in this context that this faith is a saving faith. That moment that you first trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of sins, that you were justified, set apart, just right, made right with God through the offering of Christ. That salvation, being born again at that moment, is faith. I think Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 6 would say that these are the things that accompany salvation in chapter 6. And here Peter is saying, from that faith, this is what we add. We add because he's already provided everything we need. Because he's done that, this is our responsibility. This is how we participate. We add to our faith virtue. Virtue in this sense is a moral excellence that is accompanied with courage. Boy, we need a little more virtue in the world, don't we? What, how do we take this? How do we take moral excellence and courage? If you take moral excellence and courage and kind of put them in a blender, you get somebody that comes out that says, you know what, this is right and I'm willing to stand for it. This is right or this is wrong and I am willing to take a stand on that. This is what God's Word says. I believe it and I'm going to walk in this. There's not a, this person has a moral backbone. This person understands what is right and understands what is wrong and lives to the degree that they can support and, and, and magnify what the Word says. They embody boldness and courage in moral excellence. That's virtue. Add to your faith virtue. Think about the relationship there. There's a big difference between faith and virtue Faith, if you think about it, is as a believer, I think, okay, I have faith, I believe. Virtue is the expression, the tangible expression of what I say I believe. Virtue without faith, or faith without virtue, would cause me to wonder if I really have faith in the first place, right? If I have an apple tree, but it doesn't produce apples, I would wonder, is it really an apple tree? This virtue, I must be very careful to say to myself, God, God, if I have this faith, I want to add virtue. Am I bold and strong in what I know to be right or wrong? Am I willing to live to that standard of moral righteousness with courage? Am I willing to take a stand? Do I have a backbone? The next thing that we add to virtue is knowledge. Now, before I told you that there were five times in eight verses the word knowledge was used in the opening chapter of this letter. And most all of the time, that word was epinosis. Remember, it was knowledge on top of knowledge. This one's not. This is just knowledge. This means to learn, to study, to experience. Wisdom. That's what this means. If I have faith, that manifests itself in a moral courage, what am I going to want to do? What's going to feed that moral courage? It's knowing more. I want to continue to study the Word. Why? So I can apply that to my life. That through faith I can exhibit that in moral courage. Self-control. One of the fruit of the Spirit. Self-control means exactly what it is, to control oneself. If you think of it this way, it is the power over that within. This is sin. I see that sin. I'm tempted in that sin. I'm going to turn from that sin. That's what that is. It's control over self. It is control over that 
which is within. You're able to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. But then we see steadfastness. Add to your self-control steadfastness. If self-control is the power over that with it, that is within, steadfastness would be power over that which is outside. I'm willing to, I'm willing to face trials and persevere. This is the stick to of our faith. I am committed to this. I am going to continue to trust Christ. I'm going to continue to walk with Christ. I'm going to continue to hold to the truth. That same power over self on within and in self-control is exhibited in, in perseverance and steadfastness on the outside. And then godliness. Add to your steadfastness godliness. Do not allow the trials to, to be, make you embittered towards God and towards others. Continue to remain, to have a deep love and reverence and commitment to God. That's what that means. A commitment and a deep love and reverence for God. And add to your godliness, brotherly affection or brotherly kindness. This word, there are several words for love in, in the Greek, and this one is actually phileo uh, or Philadelphia. It's where we get the, the name for the city, the city of brotherly love. When phileo is used, when, when Philadelphia is inferred in this sense, it is talking about the love that is expressed between brothers and sisters in Christ, the love that we have as a church family. So with my godliness, I need to add brotherly kindness. God, I, I want, I'm committed to you. I'm deeply committed to you. And if I'm deeply committed to you, am I committed to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I deeply committed to see their highest good? Am I loving them? Am I interacting with them? Am I meeting practical needs? Am I encouraging them? Am I uplifting them? Am I praying for them? Am I utilizing my spiritual gifts in their life? I guess I wish it would have stopped there. <laughs> I do. But he doesn't. He says, and add to your brotherly affection, love. Not phileo. Not the love that you and I showed one another. Agape. Agape love is described as God's love for the world. In, Rome, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, that's agape love. That I would be willing to seek the highest good for the worst of the world. It's that kind of love that consumes us and possesses us and causes us to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us and spitefully use us and persecute us. You know what Peter does? He's a genius. He's an absolute genius. And the fruit of the Spirit, which is penned by Paul through the Spirit, love is mentioned first. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love is the first one in the fruit of the Spirit. But here in the divine nature, it's the last one. In the fruit of the Spirit, it's a cornerstone. Here in the divine nature, it's a capstone. So which is it? Yes. It's everything in between. You see, here's the deal. If I'm looking at this divine nature, I can't sit back and say, all right, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness. Yeah, brotherly affection. I might be feeling pretty good about myself on certain days with that, but then it gets to love and I'm slammed back down. You know why? Because so rarely do I exhibit that God kind of love. When someone makes me mad, what do I do? I get mad back. When somebody does something evil to me, what am I so tempted to do? What is the path that I so quickly want to go down? I want to do bad to them. Yeah, there's some of these I might shine in at times, but when it comes to love, I find myself horrible. I do. I find myself, man, I messed that up. I missed it. Genius. 
None of us can get back and go, <laughs> got that one, made it. There's not one of us alive that can look at these qualities and at the end of the day say, I nailed every one of them. Nailed them. He's a genius. Because even though you and I get to the top, and we realize how much we miss it. Where do I fall? I go back to the bottom and I add to my faith. Agape love. God, I'm trying. It's hard. Faith. It's a mustard seed. childlike. I can get that. Oh, aren't you thankful? In this awesome progression of the divine nature with love, agape love, divine love as the capstone, aren't you thankful that that first step, you can fall into it? It's not some tall step. It's not something we have to jump. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that faith in Christ is necessarily an easy thing. I'm saying in the New Testament, it's described as childlike and a mustard seed. Peter says, faith. Add to your faith virtue. Yes, love is the capstone. These stand as a checklist. We don't like checklists. I think I ought to be able to look at my life and say, God, is there agape love living here? And if there's not, what do I need to do? I need to back up. God, is there brotherly kindness? Am I showing love to my brothers and sisters in Christ? God, is there godliness, steadfastness, self-control? What's the path? What can I expect? For if these qualities are yours and increasing, he says in verse 8, you will never be ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord. Oh, how many of us want to be fruitful for the kingdom? I hope we all do. I hope we all want to be effective and fruitful. Peter says this is the way we can know what to expect. If you do these things, you don't have to worry about fruit. Verse 9, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted he's blind. Having forgotten, he was saved, cleansed from his former sins. First he used the positive example, the positive path. Then he says, if you don't possess these and they're not increasing, you're not diligent in that, you don't have them at all, you're going to forget that you were cleansed from your former sins. Does this mean that all of our sins aren't forgiven at, at salvation? I don't believe so. I don't find that. You see, for every believer, there should be this dear moment. There should be a grand thought in our mind. When everything else is crazy, there ought to be this one treasured place we go to, and it's Calvary. We sing about it, we read about it, we have pictures to depict it, to remind us of that moment we came to faith in Christ. The moment we ascended Calvary's hill, looked at the dying limb of God on that center cross, confessed our sin and our need of Him, and confessed our faith in Him as our Lord and Savior. That's dear. And the person that doesn't possess these qualities, they've forgotten. It doesn't mean they're not saved, it means they've forgotten. What a horrible, gloomy place to be. What an awful place to be. If one has forgotten where he was saved from, it would be hard to think that he would ever imagine where he was saved to. He's become numb and dull. For, in this, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You'll never stumble. Wow, that'd be nice. I've got a lot of scars in my life from falling down spiritually. I've got a lot of relational scars. I've got a lot of emotional scars. I've got a lot of mental scars. I've got some physical scars too from falling and stumbling. Peter says if you practice these things, you'll never fall. 
Never stumble. You'll keep making progression. And then, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen, we read that one, and maybe you read it and you're like, oh, that's not very cool. See, in our mind, we may think that not falling, I like that. To be effective and fruitful down here? Yeah. The most beautiful. The most beautiful. Of all of those promises. Is that for the one who possesses those qualities and increases in them. Receives a rich entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what that means? No doubt it's near and dear to Peter's heart because he's about to die. Peter says this, you will sweep through the gates of glory. That God will withhold no expense in your arrival. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? It's just like God, isn't it? To do something like that for something He told me to do and gave me the power to do in the first place. And I just participated in it. We don't know what this rich entrance is, but I have reason to believe it is probably hearing these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Let me end with this. You may have heard this list, read this list, saw this list, and thought to yourself, I don't know that those are really exhibited in my life. Let me just ask every one of us so we're all on that same level. This morning, would you put your profession aside? A prayer you prayed, would you put that aside for a moment? And would you just focus on your progression? If you took away, let me say this. I know people that are willing to wager eternity on a prayer they prayed many years ago that has bore little to no fruit in their life. No change. No transformation. But they cling to a prayer they prayed. Can God hear a prayer? Yes. Can a simple prayer prayed many years ago save? Yes. But if there is no transformation. What does he say? Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. That's what Peter said. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. Make sure you're saved is what he's saying. If these qualities are not in, go back to the very beginning. Don't go back to self-control. Don't go back to steadfastness. Go back to faith and ask yourself, do I have saving faith? Do not this morning hold on to a prayer that was prayed many years ago with no or little transformation. If that prayer prayed many years ago has only changed where you spend an hour or two once a week, I would call that into question. Was it legitimate? I'm not calling anybody this morning to question their salvation. I'm asking you to make your calling and election sure. Eternity is too big of a price. If you've never trusted Christ today, is that day. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, there'll be some, but not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, this morning, this is a weighty challenge that Peter's given. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit, that powerful spirit, that he would search our hearts. And God, if we have been clinging to the memory of a prayer 
that was not coupled with saving faith, I pray that your spirit would not leave us alone until we have been brought to the place of a true conversion, a prayer that is mixed with saving faith for the forgiveness of sin. Father, do not let us leave here. Do not let us take another breath. Do not let us move one more inch, Father, without making our calling and election sure. Take us back to faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.